one. Now the word of the Lord came unto Jonah, the son of the mighty sea. Arise, go to Nineveh, that great city, and cry against it, for their wickedness has come up before them. But Jonah rose up to flee into Tarshish from the presence of the Lord, and went down to Joppa, and he found a ship going to Tarshish. So he paid the fare thereof, and went down into it to go with them into Tarshish from the presence of the Lord. But the Lord sent out a great wind into the sea, and there was a mighty tempest in the sea, so that the ship was like to be broken. Then the mariners were afraid, and cried every man unto his God, and cast forth the wares that were in the ship into the sea to lighten it off. But Jonah was gone down into the sides of the ship, and he lay and was fast asleep. So the shipmaster came unto him and said unto him, What meanest thou, O sleeper? Arise, call upon thy God, if so, uh, that God will not think upon us that we perish not. And they said every one to his fellow, Come, let us cast lots that we may know for whose cause this evil is upon us. So they cast lots, and the lot fell upon Job. Then said they unto him, Tell us, we pray thee, for whose cause this evil is upon us. What is thine occupation, and whence comest thou? What is thy country, and of what people art thou? And he said unto them, I am a Hebrew, and I fear the Lord, the God of heaven, which hath made the sea and the dry land. Then were the men exceedingly afraid, and said unto him, what hast, Why hast thou done this? For the men knew that he fled from the presence of the Lord because uh, he had told them. Then said they unto him, What shall we do unto thee, that the sea may be common to us? For the sea wrought and was temptuous. And he said unto them, Take me up, cast me forth into the sea. So shall the sea be common to you, for I know that for my sake this great tempest is upon me. Nevertheless, the men rode hard to bring it to the land, but they could not, for the sea rolled and was tempestuous against them. Wherefore they cried unto the Lord and said, We beseech thee, O Lord, we beseech thee, let us not perish for this man's life, and lay not upon his innocent blood, for thou, O Lord, hast done as he pleased thee. So they took up Jonah and cast him forth into the sea, and the sea ceased from her raging. Then the men feared the Lord exceedingly and offered a sacrifice unto the Lord and made vows. Now the Lord had prepared a great fish to swallow up Jonah, and Jonah was in the belly of the fish three days and three nights. May God add his blessing to the reading uh, of his word. <coughs> stinking city. He hated the place. Why should he warn the Ninevites about God's judgment? After how they had treated his people, they deserved to be wiped out. The last thing Jonah wanted to do was for his enemies to receive God's blessing. So he ran as fast and as far away from God, from what God wanted him to do. But God had other plans. You know the story. God stirred up a storm. God, or Jonah, bailed out of the boat and ended up in the belly of the big fish. God gave Jonah time to uh, think over his actions and attitudes. And for the first time, Jonah did not complain. He prayed. Probably the only time anyone ever prayed for a fish burp. The prayer was answered. And Jonah eventually traveled to Haiti now. He preached to the people there. Though his odor wasn't appealing, his message was, and the Ninevites repented. God related, as Jonah knew that he would, and Jonah fumed furious over the turn of events he saw. 
we see that in chapter 4. You know, we can be so difficult, but God is so patient and merciful. The book of Jonah is a fascinating account of one man's futile attempt to run away from God. It is a story of God's love for even the most unlovable, despicable people we can imagine. And of our responsibility to tell them of the good news. First of all, the importance of the book of Jonah. Four chapters. One of the smallest in the word of God. But it gives us a great lesson in the futility and danger of backsliding. Now Jonah was a backslider. He was a God-called man and he was a God-called prophet. But God was calling him to do something that he absolutely did not want to do. To go to Nineveh and preach a message of judgment. Now the Ninevites were great enemies of Israel. In fact, the Ninevites had made life miserable. Uh, they were especially a brutal people to Israel. But here, uh, more important than that fact, is a backslide. And we know that any one of God's children, including any one of us this morning, can backslide. And it's all over the Word of God. Of backsliders. You look at the great man David. You look at great King David. A man after God's own heart, and yet uh, after the sin with Bathsheba, he became a backslider. He became out of the will of God. And God would have to bring him back. Just read the 51st Psalm and I think the 32nd Psalm. And, and he would, he would weep bitterly over his sins. God would restore him. God would bring him back. But his house hold in his life would never be the same. Read, read in the Word of God uh, about and even his own son, house went again. And then we see a great time as we, we celebrate in Easter in about a month. We see a great type of the death and resurrection of Christ. That is, three days and three nights in the belly of the well. And our Lord was in the earth three days and three nights. So we see here, and in fact our Lord uh, makes reference to Jonah. You know, there's a lot of scholars, a lot of people don't believe this. They don't believe that it literally happened. They don't believe that there was a literal fish that swallowed Jonah. <laughs> and, uh, but I do. And uh, I do because the Word of God says that it happened. And Jesus corroborated it. So that's, that's good for me. Now, you know, some people may say, Oh, you're an right, intellectual or you're just so such a simple. Well, people can call me what they want to. I don't care. I just believe what it says there. I go with it and I don't worry about it. But uh, it, it is a time there we see. And it shows that even a wicked and a harsh city as Nineveh can repent and judgment can be spared. And I'm going to tell you folks, there's some of the worst people, most brutal, uh, sin-cursed people there uh, in the city of Nineveh. But yet, as we saw last week, it's one of the most successful revivals that's ever been preached. And the reason being, according to the Word of God, there was 100% repentance. 100% change. Not even Paul could say that he had 100%. I don't even believe Jesus, the very Son of God, could say that. So we see the importance of the book of Job. And we see, secondly, the call of God to save a sinner. Notice there 
In the first and second verses, the word of the Lord came in Jonah, the son of Amadi, saying, Arise, go to the of that great city and cry against it, for their wickedness has come up before me. So God here calls his servant, and there's a good reason. The countdown has begun. Six weeks until the judgment of God will be wrought upon the city of Nineveh. Now God always gives warning when judgment is about to happen. Now, every time that He sent it upon Israel, He always gives them warning by the preaching of the prophets to repent. So He's giving them a warning here. You've got six weeks. Six weeks left for the countdown of wickedness. Six weeks left for the countdown of life. Six weeks left for the countdown of prophetic fulfillment. Is there any hope? Will Nineveh repent? And the answer is yes. But there's a condition. The whole press and the prophet named Jonah, and he's relaxed. He's not going to do what God wants. God says to Jonah, arise, get moving, go preach the message of judgment. Now Jonah stands for the modern church. As a whole, the modern church is asleep here in these last days. We're not proclaiming the Word of God in the way that we should be. We're not preaching against sin in the way that we should be. And we're not proclaiming the uh, message of God's coming and the judgment which will follow. The church is just not doing that. I mean, as a whole. Now, you have some Bible-believing churches that will preach the inerrant and fallible Word of God and will preach the second coming, and will preach the judgment of God. But as a whole, you're not getting it the way that it stands in America. And then we see Nineveh stands for a lost world. And teetering on the brink of doom and destruction. And it's coming, folks. It's coming to this country. God will have to apologize. It's been said. God will have to apologize to Sodom and Gomorrah if he does not rain judgment down upon this country. But yet he's a God of mercy. And he wants all to come to repentance. And Nineveh will come. We see thirdly the condition of Jonah's heart. And we notice in verse 3, it's rebellious. Jonah rose up to flee into Tarshish from the presence of the Lord. Instead of going to Nineveh, which was east toward Assyria, he went west, he went down to Joppa. I meant to Joppa. That was our first stop when we went to Israel. The very city there where Jonah went down to catch the boat to try to get away from God. And if you remember in the book of Acts of 10, that's also the place where Cornelius had the vision there in uh, John Peter had the vision there in John. So instead, and he, he's going west toward what is now modern day Spain. Jonah's disobeyed God. He would not preach against Nineveh. Why not? Well, he probably feared for his life. First of all, Nineveh was the city of Israel's greatest enemy there, the Assyrians. It would be very risky to go and to preach and to even go to the city, much less to preach. He would probably get killed, certainly. He would get persecuted in some way. And, and it's, uh, I think of the uh, young lady there that died at the hands of ISIS, the social worker. 
and uh, they were having her memorial yesterday. She's a modern day martyr just because God uh, calls us and he'll give us the protection but it is weak. But we may have to die for the faith. We may see the day in this country, in fact I believe we're already seeing it, where we'll die for the sake of the gospel. And there was all, there's always a risk there when you answer the call of God. And then Jonah had a message of judgment. And uh, God, God is doing completely contrary to what Jonah wants. Jonah wants Nineveh to be wiped out in judgment for what they did his people. He could care less about it. He could care less about their salvation. He wants them wiped out. He wants them destroyed. He wants the judgment hand of God to be put on. And he just totally is in disagreement with <coughs> what God's wanting to do. And another reason that Jonah ran in the opposite direction, he was a disobedient prophet of God. He was out of the will of God, a lot like the prophet, prodigal son. You know the story of the prodigal, and he was a son. Came into dad one day, wanted his inheritance, <coughs> and gave it to him, and gave him an argument. Went out into the world and the riotous and sinful living, spent his money, and all his friends were gone. Then finally he wound up in the pig pen, came to his senses, went home. His father received him. And there is a lesson there. God will receive us when we backslide. God will take us back. He'll always take us back. We, a lot of people say, Preacher, I've sinned and I've done. God ain't going to have no use for me. Well, that's not true. If you come in, in true repentance, God will take you back. There may be consequences for your actions, for your sins. There's always consequences to sin. I know a young man, and if I was to call his name this morning, every one of you would know him, but I'm not going to call his name. He's a child of God. But yet he got away from the Lord. He got into the world, got into drugs, got into everything else. God forgive him. And he'd tell you that if he was here this morning. But there was consequences. Consequences upon him and his family. And um, but God will take us back. He's always willing to take his children back. So uh, when we come to the point of departing from God's will, then the downward trail of backsliding begins. Now the Bible says uh, there's a pleasure in sin for a season. But if you're a child of God this morning, you're not going to enjoy. You might enjoy it for a little while. But after a while, you're going to come to your senses like the prodigal son. You're going to say, man, this is not miserable. I'm down in this hell hole. I'm down in this pit. God bring me out. Like the prodigal son, I can't go on like this. I'm going home to my father. Yeah, I'll be a servant. I'm no worthy, more worthy to be called a son. But man, anything better than this. And then many escape. Won't escape from their problems. They go to, to alcohol. Some will ignore them. But your problems will always catch up with you. And that's because the problems are in us, not in our surroundings. And you know what? A lot of people say, well, if we could just bring people out into a perfect environment, if we could just get them out of poverty, or if we could just get them out into different circumstances, they'll do that. Well, that may or may not be true. In fact, I, I don't 
if you look at the situation with Adam and Eve, man, they were in paradise. They had it made. They had everything. But yet, something in the heart of Eve, that day she was offered the fruit, wanted to yield. The problem with man is always a sin problem in the heart. You know, we learn from Jonah we can't hide from God. We may think we can. We may, you know, go to the uttermost parts of the earth and do as everything under the sun contrary to His Word. You can't hide from God. He'll always find you. He'll always find you. The first place, you know, the irony, we were saved from the world. But the, the first place that a Christian runs to when they're disobeying God is to the world. Saved from the world. I change where we're going right back to it. The old preachers used to say that's like a dog running back with her bonnet. Going back to what you were saved from. Thinking you can have it back. Christians try to get lost in the world and hide from God. We can't hide from God. We can't hide from God in the world. Then backsliding brings grief to ourselves. It's usually in circumstances. Usually God will engineer circumstances which you will be most miserable. And you may even get into trouble. Look here what he did to Jonah. He manufactured a storm when he got on the boat there in Jonah. And as they were going along, Jonah was asleep in the hull of the ship. And so it started a terrible tempest, a terrible storm. And the mariners there were crying out, God save us, they're crying to their gods. And then they, you know, they, they woke Jonah up to say, what are you doing down there asleep? Cry to your God that we can get out of this. Jonah said, well, I can tell you exactly what's wrong. The problem with me, you need to throw me overboard and the storm will quit and it will subside. Well, they decided to try to row it out and they couldn't. So finally, they threw Jonah out of the ship. So no backslider is happy uh, when they're fighting with God. You won't be happy. If you're really saved this morning, you won't be happy in the world. You won't be happy sitting against God. You will be one of the most miserable persons on the face of the earth. <clears throat> Backsliding separates, separates us from God's fellowship. Blatant sin, you know, God keep looking upon the sin. It, 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 it hampers, it destroys even our communion, our fellowship with God. And then backsliding brings grief to others. <coughs> Backslider affects those around you. Other people will suffer because of your of a person's backsliddenness. It, it brings a grief to, to family and to those around them. And then it brings grief to God. Can God be grieved? Yes, indeed He can. <coughs> but one of His children, whom He, whom His Son bled and died for, yes, indeed, we can grieve the heart of God. We, might, we certainly can. Now we see finally, fourthly, Jonah's deliverance. So we knew the storm was because of him. And he gives instructions for the sailors there to throw him out to sea. And he didn't want to do that. 
But eventually, they did. They prayed there in uh, the 16th verse. And the men feared the Lord exceedingly and offered a sacrifice unto the Lord and made vows. Never really stopped to look at that 16th Maybe these men came to know the Lord as a result of that. And made vows and sacrificed to the Lord. That indeed is possible. So they threw him over. And God prepared the great fish. Perhaps a whale. Um, I think it very well could have been a whale, even though they're mountains still look upon them as fish. It would certainly be big enough to swallow a man. But God, you know, God had God had plans for Jonah and what I call whale school one on one. He would get Jonah ready to go preach the message of judgment. There would be no more running. He would school him. And, and, and that's the way it is. That's the way it is with us preachers. You know, sometimes God has to school us to get us ready to do. God would go to any length to get Jonah right with him because he had a job. 